Okay, uh, thank you for being here. It's a very a great honor for us to be at the legendary Savoy doing this presentation. Uh, Diego Hernandez Baquedano, I'm Benito Molina. Uh, we will be talking about uh, Baja seafood, uh, no, uh, seafood Baja style, and we're basically going to tell you a little bit where we come from, what we do. Uh, the, what you're tasting is right now is an oyster with a pig strutter and uh, a bologna with a tomato sauce. The bologna, we will do a demonstration at the end, is this uh, shell that is a univalve. It's, a very f it's one of the most uh, expensive and most appreciated uh, shellfish in the world. It has only one shell, as you can see. It sticks to the rock like this. And uh, this one, it comes from its farm race. It came in my bag with me uh, on the plane. It's uh, from Erendira. Erendira is about an hour and a half south from Ensenada. And they have been producing abulone for a, a little over 20 years. Abulone was almost extinct uh, because due to overfishing in uh, China and Japan, it's very appreciated. And in Baja is one of the places that has more abulone in the world. And they almost finish it all. So now we have the farm and we work with the farm raised abulone. Uh, my restaurant is this year will be 15 years and since we opened abulone has been on the menu. Uh, this abulone is like four years old. Uh, a regular abulone or what people are were used to eat were abulone is like this big that were like 30, 40 year old abulone and they overfished it so they didn't reproduce and it was a very big problem. No? Entonces, <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm Diego Hernandez and I was I was born and raised in Ensenada. In the in the first restaurant that I've ever worked was Manzanilla under Chef Benito. So basically, even even if at, at my parents' house I used to eat this kind of seafood, I didn't learn how to cook it until I work under Benito. So everything I know about seafood is because of <laughs> of, of him. <laughs> um, in in Ensenada, Ensenada is also a, a very one of the most important. Uh, port towns of Mexico because of the way we treat seafood. Uh, since the beginning of 1900, we had a big uh, migration of Japanese who took over the, the fisheries in, in the town. So all the, all the, f the, the, the way we treat the fish in, 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 the, in the fisheries in around Ensenada is, is with very, uh, a very respectful way and that's why uh, our seafood became very famous. That doesn't mean that in other ports there is no good seafood, it is. But the way, the, the connections between, between the fishermen and the consumer is very, is very short and, and is very good uh, taken care of and, and that's why we have this uh, great quality seafood. Also one of the big uh, markets that, that is in, in Ensenada is for the tuna, uh, which I think I think you are already trying. It's the other dish is a is a green tuna ceviche. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 tuna farms. It's a, it's like the big thing in Ensenada. Uh, basically, um, like like marine cowboys, they take uh, little tunas into these big farms and they feed them with sardines until they they get uh, big. And the main consumer is Japan. So. Most of the tuna that Ensenada produce goes straight to, to the Tsukiji market in Tokyo. And because of the work of chefs like Benito, and now that Baja has a whole movement of using local ingredients, we managed to have these uh, kind of products now like, uh, used in a very local way. Uh, that that was something that uh, 15 years ago wasn't happening. All, the, all these great, great ingredients were all shipped to Asia. But now you have uh, in Ensenada you have local markets where where regular people can just go and, and, and shop this kind of ingredients. So so the work the the way uh, restaurants like Benito's now mine and other chefs uh, have managed to work with local ingredients has uh, created a market for local consumers too. And that same thing happened with all the vegetables too. And it's very important to say Ensenada at some point was the most important tuna fishing port in the world. The, the yellowfin tuna run is uh, one of the biggest ones in the world, it runs through the Mexican Pacific. And uh, at some point the American fleet, tuna fleet used to fish in the Mexican waters and when the 200 mile uh, border or, or uh, 
national waters was declared so the American tuna fishing boats couldn't fish anymore on the Mexican coast. They, they did the tuna embargo that still goes on today. The, the U.S. doesn't buy tuna from Mexico since, I mean, it's like 25 years, something like that, maybe more. And they, that almost killed uh, Ensenada. Ensenada was, the, I mean, the more tuna boats fishing in the world were in Ensenada at some point, so the town lived on the tuna. So when the tuna embargo from the states happened, it just almost killed the place. And it's a very sad story. The story says that uh, we used to fish dolphins. So this is a very important part of my uh, career. I work on a tuna boat. Uh, I did it twice because I wanted to see how, how true the dolphin story was. I was on a boat for the first trip uh, one month at sea without seeing land. I was the last guy on the boat. I cook dishes, wash. Uh, the toilets, everything for 24 crew members during a whole month outside in the ocean do fishing tuna. And no, it's not true, we don't fish dolphins. I mean, a few dolphins die, but I mean, the ratio is very, very small. No, nothing compared to what the was published or said. You know, it was said that we had a dolphin in the cans, and dolphin is a mammal, so it's a complete different type of thing. I mean, it's, a, it's like venison, and tuna, well, it's of course a fish, so there is no way you can put dolphin in a can and say it's tuna, and it doesn't happen. No? So Ensenada, uh, that was a very big, uh, I mean, a big hit. It almost killed the place. And uh, the wine industry revived Ensenada. Today, en Ensenada is the wine, the wine destination, the most important wine destination in the country. The Guadalupe Valley, the Santo Tomas Valley, and Ojos Negros also, is where uh, most of the wine in Mexico is produced. So we are blessed to have the best seafood in the country with the best wine and the best olive oil. So it was just a matter of putting everything together. So we have all these beautiful ingredients, and, and right now, uh, my place is uh, going to be 15 years now, and maybe for the past eight years, uh, Ensenada is now like the big hype. You can go to restaurants in Cancun, Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, and you will find the Ensenada oysters, the abuloni, the tuna, the vegetables, and of course the wine. So it's, it's a very influential uh, place for Mexican gastronomy today, and, it's, and that is due to the ingredients we have in this beautiful place. It's uh, the currents that come to the surface in Ensenada come, of, come from Alaska, so it's very cold water, and this cold water makes the, all the shellfish and the seafood to be so good, and also makes the mi microclimate in the valleys for the wine and the, and the olive trees. The en Ensenada, like like Benito said, is is one of the most influential places now in in Mexico, and I think is the it said like the starting point to to the now revolution that uh, Mexican cuisine is is going through. Uh, but it it wasn't just about the ingredients, but I think the like like the main thing that that started changing everything was the wine industry. So when when the wineries when when People like, like Hugo da Costa, for example, thought about a project called uh, Mexican wine. That, that wasn't something that was really going on 15 years ago. He thought about uh, a chef who can cook Mexican food for Mexican wine. That's when Benito got into, into the game and, and come to Ensenada. So um, this- We have Hugo da Costa in the back over there. He's the most important winemaker in the country. Un placer tenerlo aquí, vos. Gracias. <laughs> so this this decision that looked very simple, it it, it really generated something very different for the, for the whole uh, food movement in Mexico because because Benito may have Benito and Hugo may have created an example of a of a very uh, terroir concept, eating, you know, wine, food uh, from the soil and the ecosystem where it belongs. But uh, also other thing that happened is that uh, when great chefs like, like Juan Maria Arzac from Spain opened two restaurants in Mexico City, he brought two great chefs that now are our friends, and, and they were looking for the best ingredients to cook Spanish food in Mexico. And they found these ingredients in Ensenada through Benito's restaurant and the wine country and all of this as, that was started happening. So they started brought these uh, ingredients to Mexico City, and that was just, that, that just set an example of, of how good Mexican ingredients can be. And I, I'm not saying that 
that Benito or Hugo or, or Bruno Teisa changed uh, Mexico. What I'm saying is that little decisions can make big differences. And now, uh, now uh, like maybe 10 years ago, everybody was shipping uh, a lot of seafood and vegetables and cheeses from Ensenada to, the, to these big restaurants. But now, every, every state in the country has these uh, great traditional restaurants, but also great uh, revolutionary restaurants and, and, and young chefs that are doing things uh, locally. So now, uh, ingredients from, from Chiapas or from Tabasco or from Veracruz are now well known from all of us and we, we share ingredients and we connect every dot. And that's what happened, that was really happening with Mexican food and, and that's why you're hearing a lot about Mexican food movement now these days. Yes, the, we have a wine festival called Las Fiestas de la Vendimia. This year is going to be the 25th uh, uh, year it's done. And it ha this has been a crucial point in, in Mexican gastronomy because uh, when, I when I used to work for the winery, when Hugo was my boss in Santo Tomas, we, we started inviting chefs from, from central Mexico to uh, Ensenada. The first time it happened, it was in 96, I think. The chef from the Four Seasons in Mexico City, uh, his name is Glenn Eastman, he's an American chef. And uh, another French guy went to do the, the big gala dinner and in this big event, the, the, while they were in the kitchen, the fisherman came to the kitchen with a swordfish the size of this table. <laughs> Hello, here it is. And the chef from the Four Seasons, I mean, his pants dropped. It was like, what? How do you get this in the door of the restaurant? Why don't I get this in Mexico City? I mean, I have to go to the fish market at 3 in the morning, and there is no swordfish this size in the market. So there was this guy in the kitchen, uh, his name is Pablo Ferrer, an oceanographer from the university in Ensenada. That is also a very important point. The, uh, the most important uh, oceanography university in, the co in Mexico is in Ensenada. So there is this big scientist community in research of the sea, the ocean, the aquaculture, uh, the abulonis race, like I was saying, oysters, mussels, uh, different seaweeds. So this guy, Pablo Ferrer, who was an oceanographer from the university, was in the kitchen helping because he loves cooking. And he was there helping and he heard the chef from the Four Seasons say, why don't I get this fish in Mexico City? And then he started shipping fish to the Four Seasons and today he's the most important fishmonger in Mexico. So now he's he the top chef of Mexico. <laughs> see, see, he's now gonna do top chef Mexico, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Fiestas de la Vendimia is, is a, like, a, a, like a turning point in, in modern uh, history in, in gastronomy and winemaking in Mexico. It was where it all came together. Thank you. Where it all came together in one place around the wine in, the, in like the Mexican Mediterranean, as, as it is called, because I mean, you can see the landscape there and it could be. It could be south of Spain, south of Italy, it could be France. I mean, if they don't tell you it's Mexico, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, even for Mexicans, when they go there the first time, for me, it happened to me. When I went there the first time, I was like, wow, I never imagined that in my country we would have this beautiful Mediterranean landscape with the vines, the olive trees, and the best seafood, like we already said, no? Yeah. The, 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 the countryside where all the, all the winemaking is going on, it's also uh, a very... Uh, important way in our in our in our cooking, because uh, I I believe that the that the surrounding um, inspires your your methods or your way of doing things, and of course when you're when you have this great seafood and you're surrounded by by this land, you just you just think of grilling it, you know, <laughs> you you just want to be outside and want to enjoy the weather and. And, and enjoy the view. So yeah, it would be very important to mention that uh, Diego's restaurant, Corazón de Tierra, it's in the Guadalupe Valley. He produces all his own vegetables. He has this beautiful uh, orchard and, uh, uh, ¿cómo Vegetable garden. Vegetable garden. <laughs> he produces all his vegetables. It's a beautiful place. It's a six-room hotel, boutique hotel. If you ever visit there, that's the place to go. It's, I mean, this, like, Toscan villa in the middle of the vineyards fantastic setup and the restaurant is right next to the hotel and the story is very nice it's this couple who live in Hollywood Hills they work in movie industry in, in California and the music industry and then one day they sold their house in Hollywood and moved to the Valley of Guadalupe and built this beautiful six-bedroom place uh, 
how many years ago? Like 11 years ago. 10, 11 years and the ago. restaurant is going to be three, four. Yeah, four years. Yeah. And four years ago, they opened the restaurant, beautiful restaurant. It's, a, it's truly a fantastic place to visit in Mexico. Yeah. And, and surprisingly, my partner, um, she's, she's from London and he's from Manchester. So <laughs> they are <That's> English. <laughs> and um, yeah, what, what, I, what I do at, at the restaurant, I just try to, to keep going with the example that Benito and Hugo set for me. And um, the the example of the of the flavor of the terroir, no, the soil, the 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 climate, that that example it comes of course from the from the winemaking, but but as vines are are uh, living species, it, it's it's a plant. If you apply that same methods to, for example, a a carrot or a radish, I believe that that it also comes with the flavor of the soil and. And that's what we do. And, and to me, it's not it's not uh, it's not very important that something that something is local because now local it's a it's a word that everybody's using and and everywhere you go everything is local now. But but there is local uh, grown in a greenhouse or local grown in on the open field direct into the soil where the where the sun burns the plant or where the cold kind of. Uh, Do, does the job in the plant, and by by natural selection, not all the plants make it through all the season. But the plants that that are really strong and that can support these uh, weather changes and 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 all of that and have direct contact to the soil, uh, they a lot of of the flavor from the place where they are uh, planted comes straight to them. So it, it really makes a difference if you if you plant in the in the soil of the Valle de Guadalupe or if you plant in, in, in the soil up in a hill that has different uh, different kind of earth. You no. Know? So uh, to me it's just trying to follow that example and, and understand a better way of what really a Baja cuisine uh, could be. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate how to take the abalone off the shell. We were going to cook it in here and show you how to do it, but uh, they were afraid we were going to burn the room. So, <laughs> so just show you how to, to take it off the shell. It's the abalone you try. <coughs> Sorry. Very easy thing. Here's the abalone. Spoon. And the idea is to go with the spoon next to the shell. ¿Dónde está la cámara? Ahí estamos. Ahí está. Are we good there? Sí. Ahí está. So, very easy. You can see the shell has these beautiful colors inside. Estamos. Once you take it off the shell, it has the, the guts here on the side. Take that off, and th and there is a head. You cannot really see it from here. Maybe yes. It's the little two antennas here. Make a little cut between the antennas, and take the jaw out. And it's that would be the only part that is. I mean, it's not that it's inedible. It's just it's cartilage. That would be the part you have to take off. Is the jaw. And here, then you would. St I mean, the preparation starts from here. You can do anything else. Anything you want after this. Uh, the, the Chinese cook it w with the shell and the guts in, uh, boil it for a long time. Me, I prefer to just sear it on one side and the other. That's it. And we, what you had was just a tomato sauce with olives. And it's very, it's, that's how it has been in my menu for 15 years. It's a olive tomato sauce and epazote. Here we then have the epazote, which is a very typical herb from Mexico. Very, very aromatic. And uh, I think we're almost on time. I don't know if you have any questions. To, today on, on, on at lunch, my dish has a little bit of abalone and, and the guts that are going to be dehydrated as a, as, a, as a salt to season the dish. So you're going to get to taste a little bit of it. So I don't know if there is any questions. Nada? No. <laughs> well. OK, well, it was a great honor being here. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming. <laughs>